Hey friends, it's Tomer, and in this video, I'm going to be analyzing and ranking the new Outlaws of Thunder Junction Commander Preconstructed decks. We'll start with a short explanation of each of the deck's goals and how well they accomplish them, analyze their strengths and weaknesses, provide 10 quick upgrades to each of the decks, and then finally give my overall rankings for each of the decks. And my ranking criteria has expanded a little bit this time. Before, I used to just rank each of the decks based on two criteria. First, the face commander, how powerful it is, because that's the most important card to your deck. And then the rest of the 99, the stock list, how well that deck is put together. But last time I did this for Murders at Karlov Manor, I was very happy with all the decks. And that made some of the viewers upset because I ended up giving all of the decks very high marks, basically A's across the board, and people were not happy. They want to see a ranking guide where there's clearly a best deck and a worst deck, and that was not the video for that. So to make it less likely that I give every single deck a the same overall ranking, I'm introducing two new factors. The first one is upgrade potential. How powerful can the deck be if you have an unlimited budget and you can really go ham with it? And then the final rank is the Tomer rank, which is just my favorite deck. Like if I really like the deck, I'm going to give it an A. If I'm like mid on the deck, I'll give it a B. And if I really don't like the deck, I'll give it a C. So each precon is going to have four different rankings, one for each category, and then an overall ranking where I'm just adding up all the numbers. And if you care about the overall ranking, then there you go. If you don't care about the overall ranking, let's say you're just going to keep it as a stock list, then just focus on the commander in the 99. And if you really want to upgrade the deck, then you can uh, factor in the upgrade potential. Potential. And if you really care about my personal favorite deck or least favorite deck, then the Tomer ranking is for you. Also, one notable thing about all the precons this time, the lands are some of the best we've ever seen in precons. The main thing I look for are mana fixing lands that enter untapped, and this time each deck has a ton of these. There's still room for improvement, of course. Like, I want to see the Battle Ball lands printed in every single precon that they can be printed in. They're multiplayer lands anyway, so why not? But as someone who has been reviewing these decks since basically 2011, at least on MTG Goldfish, I think it's since like 2015, I want to say, I've noticed a significant quality jump in this particular set over the previous ones. So yeah, that's something to note. Wizards of the Coast is printing better and better lands, and that's really cool and sweet. All right, we begin with the first pre con this is desert bloom this is a lands graveyard deck that is all about ramping discarding sacrificing and recurring lands to fuel powerful support cards which is basically the standard for the lands archetype but the twist with this lands deck is it cares about the desert subtype so they care about desert lands in particular now how well does desert bloom stick to its land and desert themes well i count 10 cards that ramp lands from your library or hand that directly onto the battlefield, like Escape to the Wilds, uh, 16 cards that get lands in the graveyard through mill, discard, or sacrifice, 13 cards that get lands back from the graveyard, six cards that care about you putting lands into the graveyard, and then five cards that care about lands entering the battlefield. So those are the important cards for the main theme, which is just lands. And then for the sub-theme, deserts, well, we've got 17 deserts, which is a significant chunk of deserts actually, but only four cards that actually care about deserts with our commander being the most notable one. So overall, the deck is doing all the typical land things, but it has a particularly high emphasis on getting lands in the graveyard to generate tons of value. So it's a lands deck, which is just doing typical lands thing, but it has a very strong graveyard sub theme going on. And our commander, Yuma Proud Protector, is great at leading the stock list. Our deck is heavy on its graveyard theme and Yuma both costs less to cast for having a stocked graveyard and also helps fill it while drawing us cards. It also makes huge creature tokens as we fill the graveyard as well. And the only drawback is that it's a bit slow to get going, especially in the stock list. But mid to late game, it's a real workhorse and the mana discount means you can recast it super easily if it gets removed. So between all the ramping that this deck is gonna be doing, plus the fact that Yuma costs less and less as the game goes on, Yuma's gonna basically be on the battlefield constantly by the mid to late game. Beyond the stock list, Yuma gets ridiculous as 
as you can make near infinite amounts of creature tokens in a single turn. And we'll get to how when we deal with the upgrades. Next, let's check out the deck's ratios. As I often explain in my Budget Commander articles, every time I build a rough draft of a deck, I make sure to have a certain ratio of mana, interaction, card advantage, etc. This gives me a reference point to compare to the deck and see which areas may need improvement. My general ratio is 50 mana, lands and ramp, usually a 37-13 split, 10 card draw, cards that net you one or more cards in hand, a targeted removal, split between creature, artifact, enchantment removal, and counter magic, three board wipes, creature light decks might want one more, and creature heavy decks might want one less, two graveyard recursion, one graveyard hate to keep those graveyard decks honest, and then at least one finisher, something that can win games the turn you cast it without too much setup. That's always my starting point, which is then tweaked to suit the individual deck strategy and further tweaked with playtesting. I always find it immensely useful to figure out some quick ways to improve the deck in question. So for the ratios of Desert Bloom, I count 71 mana sources. This is 40 lands and 21 ramp. But I'm also counting all land recursion that puts all the lands from the graveyard directly onto the battlefield, which is a little bit of a cheaty face. There's also nine card draw, but I'm also counting discard draw because of our great recursion option. Or else the number is abysmally low, like two. <laughs> There's also eight targeted removal, some good, some kind of bad. Uh, three board wipes, nothing good here, honestly, even the thematic ones. 18 graveyard recursion, mostly land recursion, but a few non-land options too. One graveyard hate and one finisher, and it's a super spicy one, Rumbleweed. It's basically the lands version of Cradlehoof. It's super cool. The deck is super heavy on synergy and sticking to theme, which is often great, but sometimes has the deck running bad cards for the sake of theme. For upgrades, I'm only going to put in 10 cards and the budget for the 10 cards is gonna be under $20 US at the time of making this. So we're gonna add 10 cards worth $20 or less and we're gonna be taking out 10 cards as well. In terms of upgrades, I found only one card that was desert related specifically that is super awesome in this deck and that's Colossal Rattleworm. It's like kind of decent just casting it from your hand but ideally you want to be milling it or discarding it or putting it into the graveyard and then it's just for two mana you get to search your library for a desert card and just ramp it onto the battlefield. It's kind of bonkers. It's like a free rampant growth plus plus in this deck that you just cast from your graveyard. It's super good. Uh, Spelunking is also like surprisingly very, very powerful here. Uh, you draw a card, you put a land onto the battlefield. Um, so it's already basically an explore. And then all your uh, lands enter the battlefield untapped and all the deserts basically enter the battlefield tapped. So this just generates so much extra mana for us. And a lot of our ramp cards put those lands onto the battlefield tapped. So instead they enter the battlefield untapped and we can immediately use them. So Spelunking is like really, really good mana acceleration in our deck. But my personal favorite card in the entire deck is actually gonna be Nahiri's Lithoforming. Once we go to the mid to late game, we could like mass sacrifice a whole bunch of lands, uh, draw a huge amount of cards and then put additional lands onto the battlefield for like tons of landfall triggers. And once we have a bunch of uh, lands onto the battlefield, we have like tons of ways of mass recurring them. So now here is Lithothor forming is like a super card draw engine, uh, value engine, landfall engine, mass reanimation, setter up or just really good. Same thing kind of with Cavalier of Flame. Uh, you get to discard any number of cards and draw that many cards. Ideally, you want to just be discarding a whole bunch of lands. Uh, then when it dies, you can deal a ton of damage. It's also a haste enabler for the deck too. And it sets up all that land recursion spells. The final cards we're adding is Tato Farmer, which is a card I don't think is talked about enough. Uh, it does both things the deck really wants to be doing. Um, it wants to self mill and that you do with the rad counters and then you can uh, put lands from the graveyard directly onto the battlefield as you're milling and not only are you milling with the rad counters but the deck has so many other ways of putting uh, lands into the graveyard so it's very easy to constantly get a land back every single turn with Tato Farmer. Another card we want to be discarding or milling is Anger. It's just a really easy source of hate 
haste. Um, and then Splendor Reclamation is one of the best land recursion spells in the deck. It's one of the best uh, cards in a landfall uh, lane style archetype. Super, super good here. And since we are a lands deck in red, we can really take advantage of Valakut Exploration. Uh, it's going to be a lot of card draw in the deck. It also acts as a pseudo finisher because it can deal a lot of damage to our opponents if we, you know, trigger landfall enough times. And then also, since we can only play like one land from exile or whatever, uh, those lands go into the graveyard and then we can recur them later. Uh, Garuk's Uprising is particularly very powerful with Yuma because Yuma can flood the board with a lot of 4-2 creature tokens and that will just trigger Garuk's Uprising every single time so we can draw a ton of cards and also giving them all trample is just really really good. It means we can attack for lethal that much easier. And then the main weakness of the deck was the board wipes. I thought there's a lot of like really bad cards in the deck, honestly, but the worst of the worst were the board wipe options. They're just kind of all terrible. So I'm just throwing in Farewell as the final card. Um, it's one of the best board wipes in the entire format. And while we are a graveyard deck, we don't actually have to exile all the graveyards. So if we're not in a position that we want to get rid of our graveyard, we just use the other three options and then it's already still way worth it for six mana to wipe the board that way. And really, we just care about not exiling our lands. We don't care about the other permits on the battlefield. So we don't have any artifacts that we care about. The creatures we can give or take, honestly. Uh, same with the enchantments. It's just really the graveyard that sometimes we don't want to be uh, nuking. And then in terms of cuts, we're gonna be taking out cards that either are just bad in general or are thematic but are bad so Jenna's hydra is just bad i don't know why it's here it's just bad eccentric farmer uh and scare tiller in unholy heat these are all cards that make sense in terms of the theme of the deck which is all about like self milling and then getting lands from the graveyard for the farmer and the scare tiller but they're just kind of bad at what they're doing unholy heat is kind of cute because we are a self mill deck and we could trigger delirium fairly consistently by the mid game, but it like we just have better options in Naya colors. Like we could just run a sword of plowshares. It's like 10 times better than this. And then the final cuts, uh, Nesting Dragon is just a bad landfall uh, trigger. Winding Way is like absolutely fine, but we just added a lot better card draw options and stuff. We just don't need it anymore. Chromatic Lantern, it's fine, but like we have so many ways of ramping and mana fixing that we don't need it either. Uh, Valor Saints, also a fine card, but like we just don't need it. Like we don't care about like giving our creatures indestructible or anything. Uh, Yuma can die as many times as it wants to die. Honestly, we can keep recasting it a billion different times and then we just run better removal instead perpetual timepiece is another uh, cute way of milling ourselves but we have better mill options and then protecting our graveyard is like nice i guess in like dedicated graveyard hate metas but like it just doesn't matter that much to us honestly and then marshall's anthem is like the weakest uh graveyard recursion so we just take that out all right overall rankings the commander yuma is an easy A. The commander is very strong and wants something somewhat unique because it's focusing on deserts rather than just lands in general. Um, there is Hazazon, which does literally the exact same things that Yuma is caring about. It cares about the graveyard, it cares about deserts. So it's somewhat unique because it's another, literally another commander that does the exact same thing in the exact same colors. But meh, it's a little bit unique, I guess. But uniqueness is not being ranked here. Uh, the commander is very strong it's a bit slow in the stock list but it can get going way faster with upgrades like once we add fetch lands and stuff like that yuma becomes absolutely bananas the 99 is a b though lands is such a powerful archetype that I kind of feel like the designers heavily nerfed this list with bad cards just so it doesn't outshine the other decks. Like, there's a lot of cards here that they make thematic sense, but they're clearly, like, very weak options, whereas you could have filled out the deck with thematic cards that were way stronger instead. And I think the designers... Uh, chose not to mostly so the lands like this doesn't, doesn't just crush the rest of the table each time and then for upgrade potential I'm going to give it an easy A lands is an incredibly strong and deep archetype and you can go absolutely wild with powerful upgrades now for my Toma rank it's a B lands honestly just don't excite me personally as an archetype it kind of feels too easy um, if you love lands and you love deserts, uh, then there's a lot of here that you're going to like. But me personally, I'm just not super hype about land decks. So overall, 10 out of 12.
Next, we've got Quick Draw, which is, is it Spell Slinger? It cares about casting a bunch of instants and sorceries and then have a bunch of payoffs for doing so, aka the most is it thing possible. But the twist here is that we have a storm sub theme where we want to cast multiple spells per turn. So it's is it spell slinger storm. Now to pull off our themes and goals, we have 30 cards that are either instants or sorceries, and then we have 31 cards that care about instants or sorceries. And for our storm sub theme, we have six cards that care about casting multiple spells in a single turn. So the deck is incredibly focused on its Spellsinger theme with a bit of Storm Spice tossed in, mostly propped up by our commander. So Stella Lee is a very powerful commander. The stock list can consistently cast at least two spells per turn by the mid to late game, making her at worst a Phyrexian Arena. Occasionally, you can cast three or more spells in a single turn, letting you also copy a spell per turn as well for free, which, if you get to do so, is amazing value for a three drop. You're getting a free extra spell on top of that that you cast for free, so it's mana advantage and card advantage on top of the Phyrexian Arena effect. It doesn't happen too often, like I said, like maybe mid to late game, sometimes you'll have those turns, but when it does happen, it's really, really good. But the thing with Stella Lee is that when it's upgraded, it is utterly broken. It's infinite combo dot deck, and it's, I think, a CDH deck, honestly. But more on that later with the upgrade section. Now, in terms of ratios, we have 49 mana, 38 lands, and 11 ramp, a mix of generic rocks, and some thematic spell slinger discounts. There are 12 card draw options. A lot of them are kind of clunky to use, uh, but they're really cool and thematic, like lock and load. And then there's also a bunch of cantrips to help look through your deck. So they kind of help you find the cards you're looking for. They're not true card draw because they don't net you cards in hand, but they do help uh, with card selection. And of course, also triggering your all your spell slinger stuff. I also count six targeted removal. On the low end, honestly, and I'm also counting Niv-Mizzet Perun here, so I'm being very generous. Three board wipes. I really love Volcanic Torrent here. I think that's a highlight. Two Graveyard Recursion, with Mizzix Mastery being one of the best cards in the deck, honestly. Zero Graveyard Hate, and two Finishers. Octavia and Pyretic Charge can turn your tokens that you're making into lethal attackers. So as someone who has played Is It Spellsplinger a lot for like over a decade now, I'm looking at the list and I think it could use more mana, specifically rituals and also free spells to let you cast more stuff per turn and actually take advantage of your like storm type cards. And also some of the interaction cards are subpar, but the rest of the ratios I like a lot and the rest of the cards I like a lot too. Now, in terms of upgrades, here is where we just immediately jump into the realm of like borderline CDH, I'd say. So as I alluded to earlier, Stella Lee is kind of bonkers when you start upgrading her with untap effects. Because the way the second ability is worded, if you copy a card that can untap Stella Lee, you can then make the copy target Stella Lee, untap her, activate her again, and then keep copying the original spell over and over again for infinite untap effects and it just kind of wins the game on the spot with certain cards. For example, the best of the best option here is Twisted Fealty. If you copy the Twisted Fealty with Stella, you're going to untap Stella and put a Wicked Roll token on her. And then when you copy the Twisted Fealty again by tapping Stella again, you get another Wicked Roll. The original Wicked Roll falls off and each opponent loses one life. And you get another Wicked Roll, untap Stella Lee, recopy the Twisted Fealty, get another Wicked Roll. It's infinite life loss for your opponents just for three mana which is bonkers if you want to do the same combo but a little bit less mana efficiently for six mana you have bond of passion which just shocks your opponents to death instead of um, uh, life loss and it costs six mana instead of three but still it's a two card you win the game basically if you casted two other spells on the same turn bonkers and then 
Other ways of just winning the game and breaking this ability, Cerulean Wisps, uh, one mana, untap Stella Lee, draw a card, so you could just draw through your entire deck. Uh, refocus, exact same thing, except that two mana instead of one. Uh, Dramatic Reversal does the exact same thing, except it untaps all your permanents, so if you have mana rocks, that's infinite mana. There's a couple other cards that do the exact same thing, combos with uh, Stella Lee, so you could do infinite copies and stuff like that, um, and either generate infinite mana, or win the game on the spot, or draw through your entire deck, or both. Um, either way, no matter what card you're copying infinite times with Stella Lee, if you throw in Ral Storm Conduit onto the battlefield at the same time, whenever you're copying a spell with Stella or whatever, uh, you're pinging your opponents at the same time, so it turns all of these infinite combos into infinite damage with Ral Storm Conduit on the battlefield. So that's kind of busted. And then for the remaining cards that I'm adding to the list, uh, Frantic Search just kind of helps you get to that point where you've casted multiple spells per turn because it's essentially a free spell. Mana Geyser can also set up for that big turn, um, either to allow you to cast multiple spells or just power out whatever combo you're looking for. Uh, and then Negate is a little bit of protection. You know, the deck has like one counter spell in the entire deck. You might as well run like two or three. So I added a Negate here and also the board wipes were kind of eh, so might as well have another easy reset with Blasphemous Act, one of the best board wipes in the game. And keep in mind, I didn't even use a $20 budget here. I, this is like 10 bucks. <laughs> it's nothing. As for cuts, we're just gonna be taking out cards that are basically thematic, but just not good. Terramander, it's just not good. Leyline Dowser, I'm not sure where it wants to be good in, but it's certainly not here. Bloodthirsty Adversary is fantastic in 1v1, but not really here. Tezzer's Gambit is an odd one because we don't have many things we want to be proliferating. I double checked and there's just not much. Um, so it's a little bit weird here and just not very good. Um, and then we have a bunch of other cards that we don't really care for. Octavia and Shark Typhoon are kind of like top end finishers for the deck, but we really don't need it, especially when we've introduced super mana efficient, you win the game combos. Same thing with electrostatic field. It's not a good blocker. We're not really doing anything with the ping effect or anything like that. We don't need it to win the game, especially now with the much better finishers. Same with like gutter snipe. And then crackling spell slinger looks really cool, but I just, it's five mana and then you need to cast a spell afterwards and you have to have a high storm current. It's just way too much. Midnight Clog is a cute mana rock. It is potentially card advantage eventually as well too, but we actually want to have a, a pretty full graveyard. So this kind of is anti-synergy with her deck. Okay, overall rankings, the Commander Stella. Um, it is, I would say a B in the stock list. Uh, it's very strong, but fair in the stock precon. By the time you're starting to get real value out of it, uh, you're in the mid to late game when you actually get to activate her ability and start copying things. That's the ideal situation. When she's not doing that, she's just a Phyrexian Arena on the battlefield, which is like, it's fine. It's nothing particularly exciting though. However, once you start upgrading the deck, it's, it's broken. It's a CDH deck. I like, it, it's insane. So I got to give it like an S, I think. Like it's a B in the stock precon and then an S if you do just a little bit of upgrading. Then the 99 is a B. As someone who has played many Is It Spellslinger decks, I currently own Spellslinger decks as well too that are Is It, I can tell you that this list plays very slow, despite running a lot of stable cards in the archetype. There's not as many free costed spells as I'd like, so jamming generically fine Spellslinger cards like Talran, for example, and then waiting two or more turns to get enough drakes for it to be worth the investment to cast Talran is just lackluster in practice. Like, the cool stuff is definitely here, but the building blocks to make those cards cool is not. But as much as I will rag on the stock list, the upgrade potential is obviously an S, one of the strongest decks you could ever upgrade, honestly, in terms of precons. The commander is just utterly busted. But the main thing is that you're not just busting it with like super expensive staples or anything. You're breaking it with dirt cheap cards. Like you could turn this deck into a pub stomper for a $20 or less budget, honestly. Now for the Tomer ranking, I'm actually going to give it a B. Is it Spellslinger is one of my favorite archetypes, but this stock list is super mid. Like I'm not super excited to run it without any upgrades. And the commander is so easily broken that it's not interesting to me when you do upgrade it. Honestly, I'd be surprised if Stella doesn't soon show up as a big contender in CDH. It really is that good. 
So overall, I got to give it like a, a 12, I guess. Like the commander is just so broken. All right, we move on to the third deck. This is Grand Larceny. This is a combat focused theft deck. The goal is to smash with cheap evasive creatures, which enables our commander to steal cards from our opponent's decks to use against them. In order to do this, we have 20 what I will call evasive cards. Mostly evasive creatures that have flying or unblockable, and a few cards that grant evasion. We also have 11 cards that reward evasion or dealing combat damage to a player. And on the theft side of things, we have 25 theft cards, a variety of types, but most commonly ones that exile cards off the top of our opponent's libraries and then casting them. And we have eight cards that support stealing spells. Our commander, Gaunti, Canny Inquisitor, is what makes combat theft work. Gaunti turns all of our evasive beaters into theft enablers, and he also ramps these stolen spells, so card advantage and man advantage on the same card. Gaunti's ramp ability is a discount on casting theft spells, and it only discounts generic costs, so it doesn't help, for example, casting a one mana blue spell like Ponder. And it only applies to eight other cards that are theft related in the deck. But for the most part, you're just going to be stealing spells off Gonti's ability and then casting those same spells of Gonti's ability. So it should be fine. But my biggest strike against Gonti, and this is really weird saying it, is it's a five mana spell without any protection. Which sounds ridiculous to say, but in 2024 commander design, when three color build around commanders are usually just three mana, this is actually a weakness. Especially since our evasive creatures suck without Gaunti on the battlefield. It's a really cool card, but definitely the weakest of the four face commanders, I'd say. Now in terms of deck ratios, I count 53 mana, 38 lands, and 15 ramp. A mix of generic ramp and theft ramp. 23 card draw, and I'm counting theft cards that steal multiple cards to cast as well. Nine targeted removal, some generic, some thematic. Three board wipes, the highlight being the new Heartless Conscription. This card is awesome. Uh, there's two Graveyard Recursion. Savvy Trader is both new, thematic, and very cool. Uh, two Graveyard Hate. Just incidental graveyard hate and not very effective, like the Mimeoplasm, for example. And there's zero finishers that convincingly win the game the turn they're played. But it does run haymakers, like Thieving Amalgam can start taking over the game over a couple turn cycles. So overall, the ratios here look very good. The finishers are lacking in comparison to the other decks, but the card quality is really nice here. The mana that we have to work with is really nice. The removal, the draw, everything is really good. Just my only gripe is the finishers really. Now in terms of upgrades, there aren't a lot of cards out there that actually reward you for either casting spells from exile or uh, casting stolen spells or any of that sort of stuff in Sultai. A lot of them are like Rakdos or Slash Red, and we don't have access to those. But two really, really good ones are Tasha the Witch Queen, which we're just going to make a bunch of demon creature tokens. That's super awesome. And Tlin Kali Hunter, which has two modes that are very, very good. Uh, the first one is just recursion, and the other side is allowing us to cast spells for free, even the turn it comes onto the battlefield, which is really nice. Uh, then, in terms of theft cards that we can be adding, Grimma Sauron's Footman is really, really nice. And then we want to add more evasive creatures, so we can play on the first couple turns a couple of evasive creatures, then play Gaunti and immediately start stealing things very mana efficiently. So Miscloaked Herald is really awesome for that. Um, also adding Siren Storm Tamer, which I think is the best. It's not unblockable, but it is flying, so it's close to unblockable, and it can protect our commander, which is super important. Uh, and then Changeling Outclass uh, can't be blocked, so it's quite nice. Then the final theft card that I'm adding is Mnemonic Betrayal. It basically lets us steal all of our opponent's graveyards for a single turn, which is super fun, and uh, we can really take advantage of Gaunti's mana discount that way too. And also, I noticed that the deck kind of was lacking early ramp options. We really want to curve into Gaunti as quickly as possible because Gaunti is what makes all our evasive creatures do anything really. So I added Farseek and Nature's Lore. We have some dual forests that we can be stealing, uh, not stealing, <laughs> ramping with these cards. So that makes these even better. And then finally, we need more protection. Uh, more counter magic is nice. I, the precons are just aren't running a lot of counter magic. They usually just run like the one, I guess. Um, so we're throwing in negate. So now we have two. In terms of cuts, we're taking out the partners Ukima and Kazur. They're just not 
very good, uh, period. Void Attendant is very cute. Like, we're going to be exiling a bunch of cards from our opponents, and we could turn those into kind of like ramp, uh, but it's just not a very good ramp. <laughs> it, they, t they basically are sacrificed for colorless mana. If they were like treasure or something, I'd be much more on board, but it's just colorless mana. That's kind of meh. Uh, and then the Mimeoplasm. It's kind of like theft, but not really. It doesn't really work with the deck. It kind of works loosely with the theme, but it's just not really good here, I would say. And then the other cards we're taking out, Sage of the Beyond. Uh, it is good with what we're doing. We're casting spells from exile, but it's a seven mana or at least five mana spell. It's, ugh, it's way too much mana. Extract Brain, same thing. It just costs too much mana for what it's doing. Stolen Goods. It's like fine, it's just kind of lackluster. Same with Chaos Wong, just costs too much mana. The worst mana rock in the entire deck is Prismatic Lens, it's really doo doo. And then uh, our worst removal spell is the Blade Griff prototype. We just don't have a lot of haste enablers in this deck or anything, too. All right, overall rankings. The commander, I'm gonna give a B. The commander is a sweet build around, but just feels a little over costed compared to the other 2024 commanders, which really is a depressing reflection of power creep. But I mean, it just is what it is. I think it could really have gotten away with being like a four mana commander, honestly. The 99 though is an A. I actually think they did a great job here. There's really good deck ratios, really good cards, and a lot of cards that are thematic while still also being very efficient, which is something I did not not say about Desert Bloom, this one actually did a good job of thematic yet powerful cards. The upgrade potential is a B though. There's simply not that many good theft or cast from exile cards left to add to the deck. You really need to be in red to get access to those type of cards. You want to be Rakdos colors essentially, but you could overhaul the deck to become a low curve evasive combat deck with theft as your main card advantage instead. You really just want to load up on those one to two mana evasive creatures that have some sort of utility attached to them. And then you could really pop off that way. Even so, it's still obviously way weaker than like trying to upgrade a lands deck or a spell slinger deck, which has so much more uh, card pool and support to work with. Now the Toma rank though, I'm gonna actually give this one an A. I really like the theft archetype and I love evasive combat decks. It's less explored, this combination of theft and evasive combat is less explored than the other archetypes we've been looking at. And this is a cool mix of both, even though overall I would say because of the commander and because of the lack of upgrade potential, it is a little bit on the weaker end I'd say. So overall 10 out of 12, sure. All right, the last deck is Most Wanted. This is a combat-focused Mardu deck with a main theme being Outlaws, a new batching term that cares about the creature types Assassin, Mercenary, Pirates, Rogues, and Warlocks. So basically every single creature in this deck is going to be one of those things. The thing that ties these Rudin Tudin Outlaws together, though, is their shared love of treasure, the sub-theme of the deck. So we attack with Outlaws, make treasure, and then use that treasure various ways. So to do this, we had 34 Outlaws, 33 creatures, and one enchantment that makes Outlaws. We have 8 cards that care about Outlaws, which is on the low end because it's a new set term, but it's still kind of disappointing. Then we've got 11 treasure makers of various goodness and consistency and eight cards that care about treasures or artifacts. We also have seven cards that gain life and two cards that care about life gain. So consider that a secret third theme because Wizards of the Coast really wanted to add warlocks to the deck, I guess. <laughs> so taking Outlaws, a new term from the main set with little support, and trying to flush it out as a 100 card singleton deck is always gonna be a big challenge due to a limited card pool to work with, but the designers managed to make a cohesive deck out of it. The chosen Outlaws work together mostly due to the help of the new cards designed for the deck, especially our commander. Olivia Opulent Outlaw is a huge incentive for sticking with Outlaws, providing lots of treasures for the deck and are able to cash in those treasures to pump the team. She's a flying Outlaw, so she herself can generate treasures and Lifelink turns on those two life gain payoff cards as well. That's a lot of value for four mana. In terms of deck ratios, we've got 52 mana, 37 lands and 15-ish ramp cards, some generic rocks, and a bunch of fairly inconsistent treasure generators. But Discrete Retreat is both new and very cool. 
15 draw, lots of surprisingly good ones actually, 9 targeted removal, a lot of good ones here too actually, uh, only one board wipe that I counted, Massacre Girl, uh, an outlaw, 6 graveyard recursion, and lots of really good options here actually, 3 graveyard hate, most of them incidental and giving you extra value when you're hating on the graveyard. And then three or more finishers, like Angrath's Marauders, just doubling the amount of damage you're going to be dealing the turn you put it onto the battlefield. The deck has great ratios, with its draw, removal, and recursion being especially good. There's lots of great cards here, in fact. It's quite impressive. Now, in terms of 10 upgrade cards... I'm going to be starting with a bunch of outlaws. Surprise, surprise. So Lotho, Corrupt Sheriff is just a fantastic source of mana advantage. It makes a whole bunch of treasures just by existing. Grim Hireling is one of the best uh, treasure payoffs, and it takes up half the budget of the $20 budget for the upgrades because it really is that good. It generates a bunch of treasure tokens as you're attacking, which is all you want to be doing, and then it turns those treasures into removal, repeatable removal, so that's absolutely fantastic. I'm also throwing in Servant of the Stinger. This deck actually has quite a few ways of committing crimes, and then this is a two-drop outlaw, that has Death Touch, so people do not want to be trading down to this. And if it deals damage while committing a crime, it's just a Demonic Tutor, which is really fantastic. Swashbuckler Extraordinaire is a really cool outlaw in the deck as well, too. It turns those treasures into Double Strike for your attacking creatures, which is awesome. Final cards, we're going to be adding uh, the final outlaw support cards, essentially. Laughing Jasper Flint is just card advantage, but stealing from your opponents. And then those opposing creatures uh, become mercenaries on your side, so more synergy potential. Hellsper Posse Boss gives all your stuff haste but also enters the battlefield with two more outlaws, which is super fun. Claim Jumper is super sweet. It's more ramp in the deck, but it's also an outlaw. And then at knife point, uh, all your outlaws have first strike when they're attacking. That's great. And then whenever you're committing a crime, you're making more outlaws super sweet. I added the best board wipe in Mardu Colors, in my opinion, which is just Ruinous Ultimatum. Just destroy all your opponent's stuff and leave your stuff intact. And then this deck was missing Boros Signet. It had the other two Signets, but it was missing the Boros one and might as well curve into Olivia on turn three as opposed to turn four. So yeah, Boros Signet, it's in there. And then for the cuts, as usual, we're just going to be cutting the worst cards. Either they're just bad and not thematic or they're thematic but still bad. So Hex is not thematic, just bad. Then we've got a bunch of Outlaws that are just kind of bad. Uh, we'll move on. Fane the Broker... I've, I've never liked trading posts, I'll be honest. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna reveal a dark secret of mine. And Fane the Broker is just trading posts, but I think worse, actually. Even worse. Aetherborn Marauder, Tenured Incaster, they're just overcosted and bad. Good and limited, bad here. Uh Bandits Hall, very slow and bad. <laughs> Life's insurance. Um, I think some people like it. I don't like it. I think it's slow and bad. And then Captivating Crew. Uh, it's a powerful ability for sure, but I don't want to spend four mana and then an additional four mana to start threatening creatures. That seems bad. All right, overall precon rankings. I'll give the commander actually an A. I was debating between a B and an A for Olivia, but what I found is that Olivia is just very, very consistent as a commander and does what the deck wants to be doing, which is generating treasure. So it herself can generate a treasure each time she's attacking and she has evasion. The lifelink is also very, very nice. And also being able to pump up the team while not super mana efficient or anything is just really nice to have because sometimes they're going to be ending up with like six extra treasures on the battlefield and you don't know what to do with them. Turning them into um, a, a big boost for your attackers is really nice. So the card is very fair. It's not like a combo deck or anything. It's not super explosive or anything, but it just does really solid work. And then for the stock list, the 99, I'm actually going to give it an A. I was actually skeptical that they'd managed to get a bunch of outlaw cards, which generally don't have any uh, inherent synergy with themselves, um, and put them together in a deck and make it feel cohesive as a whole. And it actually works. Like, they found a bunch of outlaws that care about attacking and treasures, and they work very well together. I got a hand into them. And the card quality and ratios for the deck is also very high. Upgrade potential, though, I'm going to give it a B. There's very little outlaw support cards left to add, though there are a couple notable cards that are outlaws, that happen to be outlaws, rather, and are strong and care about treasures, like, uh, like Dockside Extortionist, for example. It's boring, but it works. And then finally, my Toma ranking. 
This one is a B, sorry. Uh, I'm not very interested in an Outlaw deck, honestly. And overexposure to treasures in the past couple years have made me very uninterested in that as a theme. However, I'm much more interested in Outlaw as a mechanic in general, supporting other creature types. So I'm actually very interested in dissecting this deck and taking those Outlaw cards and putting them in like an Assassin deck, in a Rogue deck, in a Pirate deck, for example. That's cool to me. So overall, uh, uh, 10 out of 12. All right, final ranking times. You've seen all the individual ones. Now I'm going to give you the best of the best. We're going to add three categories. Best stock precon, best upgraded precon, and my favorite precon. So best stock precon. Actually, and this surprised me, most wanted. I thought this was going to be the worst of the precons when I saw it at the beginning. I even did a commander ranking guide for all the outlaws of Thunder Junction and I poo-pooed Olivia in particular and I was wrong. After looking at the deck list, I was wrong. This deck actually looks very powerful right out of the box. Best upgraded precon though, to the surprise of nobody, is quick draw. It's not even close. I think if you added $20 worth of cards, if you added like $5 worth of cards, this deck gets absolutely bananas. And it's all because of the face commander. The face commander, I swear, is definitely a CDH deck. It's going to take the meta by storm. And I played uh, CDH uh, zero times in the past year. But I'm telling you, Stella is the new hotness coming soon. And then finally, the most important uh, ranking of all, obviously, my favorite one. My favorite one is actually Grain Larceny. I like evasive creatures, and I like theft, and I like putting them together. This is one of the more unique commander decks that we've seen. Uh, definitely much more unique than like Spellslinger or Lands. Um, definitely up there with the Outlaw deck in terms of uniqueness, I guess. And I like seeing that. I like seeing precons kind of explore new space instead of just giving us the same old, same old with a small twist. This one, I feel, is kind of different than all the other precons I've seen before, which I like, and I just like the themes. So they speak to me a little bit more. So there it is, friends. That is my ranking and analysis and upgrades of all four of the Outlaws of Thunder Junction precons. I did it a little bit different than the previous ones because I know people were upset. They wanted to hear what is the best. And I really liked all of the ones from Murders at Karlov Manor so much that I gave them all tied for the best. And people did not like that. So here you go. Here's uh, one best precon, the stock precon, most wanted, the best upgraded precon, quick draw, not even close, and my favorite, grain larceny. I put a ton of time and effort into this analysis, so I hope this deep dive is helpful to some folks. And for the folks who just want to know what the best and what is the worst precon out there, then hopefully I've given a good answer to that as well. But remember, the true best precon is the one that plays a turn one Sol Ring. That's always been the case. <laughs> So yeah, that's all for now. I'll be back with non-cowboy stuff soon. So until then, friends, see ya.